Hey everyone, welcome back to the arena. I'm MD, joined here by Kobe, and once again, a really special guest here in person, by the way. Long time since we've had one of these, always uh, hits a little differently, but uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and introduce her shortly. What is happening, people? I've got my friend, guys. This is Jesse, Jesse Pagliari. Jesse is a certified yoga instructor, health coach here in Chicago, and also a survivor of chronic illness caused by workplace burnout. So raise your hand if you've been impacted by workplace burnout or have felt a symptom. Probably at some point, everyone, if you're not looking, watching, we're raising our hands. Um, Jesse, thank you for being here. It's so much fun. I'm so glad to just have you here. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, why don't you just share a little bit more about who is Jesse Pagliari and kind of how you got to where you are today. Wow, deep question to start us off. Um, I'm Jesse. I'm a yoga teacher and a health coach. I went to U of I with MD and Matt, and uh, I started working in corporate America, um, you know, six or so years ago. I loved my job. I saw myself working there forever. I really wanted to like move up within the organization until all of a sudden I felt this overwhelming sense of burnout. And so I went on this healing journey, ended up leaving my job, going on a medical leave, and then a sabbatical altogether to heal myself and turned around and became a health coach and a corporate wellness consultant with everything that I learned. So where where does the... Um... Where does burnout start? Like, what what does it look like? Does it come in like a wave where you're just like boom, or was yeah. it like did you even realize it was happening and then it hit like a breaking point? Like, just talk through what you are feeling in that moment and how everything starts to transpire. So my story is not unique in that burnout felt like it hit me like a wave, but really it had been gradually building up over time. A lot of the people I coach today will feel these extreme symptoms, and when we actually go back and look at it, it has been building up over a long period of time. But basically what burnout is, is it's a prolonged um, experience of stress that ends up affecting your physical and your mental well-being. And what it really looks like is having a disconnect or a distance between you and your work as well as you and your social life. So things that you used to enjoy, you don't enjoy anymore. Um, tasks, tasks at work that you used to look forward to, um, you really continue to put them off or dread them. Um, so there's that distance there between your work and your personal life and you. Um, there's also some cognitive effects of burnout. So you start making more mistakes in areas where you wouldn't usually make mistakes. Um, you start having more forgetfulness and sort of a brain fog, if you will. And so one thing I really see with burnout a lot is people tend to blame themselves and they'll say, oh, I'm so lazy. I'm not working hard enough. I'm not applying myself. Um, but what, what it really is, is it's burnout that's happening under, under layers of, of that. And was that you? Were you that one of those people? That was me, yeah. I um, just all of a sudden woke up one day and I felt completely different. I oh. was not firing on all cylinders at work. I was dreading going to meetings, um, doing you know my daily tasks. And then I just couldn't get back to my regular energetic self. And so I went to, I think, like 13 different doctors to try to figure out what it was. Um, landed at the Mayo Clinic where they discovered that I also had chronic illness that was also related to stress. Um, and then I had to go on my healing journey from there. So you got so sick that you went from not really experiencing anything to having to go to a doctor like overnight. Yeah. So yeah. That, that can't be the norm. Oh God. Um, I hope. I think actually for most people it is. So they ignore the burnout and they'll say things like I'm lazy or I'm not applying myself or you know I'm getting poor sleep or something like that. And then all of a sudden a big event will happen where they have an anxiety attack or they have um, you know a really horrible day or you know they find themselves falling asleep at the wheel something like that that is like this wake-up call like okay this burnout this this illness this thing whatever it is has gone too far and I need to get like help from a doctor and you were you were successful at your job leading up into this and so like I, I think sometimes when I think being very stressed at my job it could be on account of underperformance yes. or feeling like I'm not doing well to begin with. Yes. But like speak to just the relationship between actually being successful at your job and how that can in of itself lead to burnout. Yeah, I was 
successful at my job, humble brag. Um, <laughs> I was in sales and, you know, I had gotten promoted um, and then I had gotten a new job at a company that was like a step up for me. Um, so I was really like doing well and proud of my performance and just hoping to grow more. Like I saw myself becoming like a VP of sales someday. That was really what I wanted. And that rings true for um, people that have burnout. They're usually top performers. They're over applying themselves. They're pushing themselves so hard that their physical and mental state is affected. So what's the inner dialogue? Like what's the voice in your head saying in those moments before you start doing the slip ups and the I'm so lazy? Gosh, I would say for me personally, it's this competitive voice. So you're really wanting to be that top performer to top performer and some companies will have like even a leaderboard and you can see especially in sales people's other people's numbers and it's like okay if i just close you know three more deals and have 10 more calls and this that, and the other thing then i can be at the top of the leaderboard and so it's really this competitive voice that i had and that a lot of my clients have that can lead to this burnout because you're focused more on checking in with what other people are doing rather than checking in on yourself and how you're feeling. And had you ever had you ever done that prior to this, checking in on yourself? How is Jesse? How am I feeling right now? Like, what is going on? Like, Never. <laughs> no, like always so competitive, played so many sports in high school. Um, in college, I would say it was more of like a social thing. Like I really wanted to have a big circle, be well known, be well liked by people. And it really had this competitive lens to it as well. So, um, yeah, I don't want people to think, oh, I'm not competitive at work. That doesn't mean I'm not competitive. It can show up in any area of your life. And for me, it was, you know, work, personal, a mix of the two. And then so when did you or how did that process unfold of the act of, I guess, becoming more self-aware of, honoring your feelings of checking in with yourself like how did you where did you learn to do that how did you learn to do that how do you employ those types of strategies like today yeah so I was so so sick like I couldn't function I was like incapacitated like I I had 30 different symptoms ulcers anxiety depression insomnia um I couldn't touch my toes I had tight muscles my hair was falling out. I would lose 10 pounds overnight. Like I oh had so God. many symptoms. I was a different like physical person um, as well as mental person because of this burnout that turned into chronic illness. And so I, you know, like I said, went to 13 different doctors, couldn't get any answers. And finally my doctor was like, you need to go to the Mayo Clinic. Like they are the only people equipped to answer what's going on. So I go to the Mayo Clinic. They diagnose me with a chronic illness. And then they say I have to go to this five day training to like better understand what's going on with me. And can I be honest? Like I thought it was such bullshit when I heard this, and th but they literally said, do yoga, um, do meditation and breath work, slow down, um, check in with yourself and how you're feeling. Um, they talked a little bit about like diet and having a healthy balanced diet. Um, but that was the first you're time. You're probably like, dude. I got sales numbers yes. to hit. Like, what do you mean slow down? Exactly. But also, like, the severity of all the symptoms you're talking about, mm -hmm. like depression and hair falling yeah, out. Yeah. If somebody told me to start, you know, doing crossing my legs and breath yeah. work, I'd be like, how oh, is this going to actually help anything? That is exactly how I felt, <laughs> both of what you're saying. One, I was like, I've got numbers to hit. I want to be a VP. Like, where does this fall into everything? I'm not going to become this, like, soft person where I'm not accomplishing anything and just meditating all day. Like that was how I was looking at it was in these two extremes. And then to your point, I was like, this isn't going to help me. I have like serious pain going on. I had chronic exhaustion, um, chronic pain, like all this stuff happening in my body. I was like, is meditating going to help? Like I had so many doubts about that. Were you, were you expecting like a conventional medicine, yes. like medical solve? Yes. Like there's going to be a pill. Yes. It's going to be like 30 days. Exactly. And then I'm going to be right back to the Jesse I was, yep. but then reverses what it really was, was a functional approach, mm -hmm. a holistic lifestyle overhaul. Can you yes. speak to like the difference of those two from your perspective? Yeah. I wanted like one clear answer and one clear solution. And then I would be back on track, making my cold calls, closing deals at the top of the leaderboard. And so when I didn't get that, it was really frustrating. And I think that's what a lot of people go through when they're experiencing burnout is they have to make these lifestyle changes and these mindset changes that 
in some ways are a lot harder to make than just taking a multivitamin every day or whatever whatever it is that you have to take every day. So it's a completely different protocol than what I was expecting. And it took me maybe like three months or so to actually adopt it because I had to get over myself being like, that's not gonna work, don't try it, it's a waste of time. And then once I started trying, um, I just started with 15 minutes of yoga every morning, like just 15 minutes, really easy, really light, nothing like a sculpt, like just light stretching and breathing. I started seeing real change in my mind, in my body and how I was showing up at work. And so that was what wow. got me on the hook to start trying the other stuff too. And I think that's a great message of just the importance of doing something. It can f be so little. But by just doing it, you are allowing yourself to actually go down that path. Mm -hmm. and, and what starts as little ends up snowballing into something much more than that. Yes. So it feels like only 15 minutes of yoga, you saw enough of a result yeah. where it's like, ooh, this could work. Yes. And then you dive in and you do more, and here you are. So how did it feel, I guess, originally to, to slow down for a Jesse that was go, go, go? Like how, talk, speak to that, because I know there was discomfort there. Like speak okay. to the, that discomfort. There was a lot of discomfort. And I think the thing that I struggled with and most people struggle with is the identity loss mm. or shift. So I thought of myself as this coffee drinking sales pro, pounding the phones all day, then going to happy hour every night, networking my butt off with all the like senior leaders, like really making a name for myself, moving up in the company and really just go, go, go. Like that was my identity. And so I had to really shift how I viewed myself and like what I thought were the important defining characteristics of myself. And what I realized was I'm not defined by, by all the things I get done in a day. Like that really has nothing to do with my value, but I was giving that much, like so much value. So the biggest shift for me was like really just accepting that my identity is fluid right now and I'm gonna see who I am throughout this process. I don't have to cling on to any idea of what I have about myself and who I am right now because I'm gonna learn about that as I go. It's interesting because there's like the external factors that you mentioned, yeah. which is the high consumption of caffeine, yes. the happy hours, obviously you're uh, probably not drinking water at happy hours. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no. Your sleep schedule is probably yes. affected. Mm -hmm. There's the external, but then right. there's also this other weight of factors coming from yeah. internal, oh, yeah. right? And and so can you just speak to <clears throat> just how critical or influential your internal is, mm -hmm. that self-talk? Like how do you, I guess, <clears throat> how did you think about the two, uh, internal yeah. versus external? Yeah, so I would say I thought that like things I was doing physically, like going to the gym or eating a green salad, would be the things that would heal me overall. And what I learned was if I went to the gym and ate a green salad, but I was still incredibly stressed and talking to myself in a really critical voice, then it would almost negate everything else I did. Because how we talk to ourselves determines the level of dopamine, serotonin, inflammation in our body. And so if we don't shift the voice in our head and our dialogue, um, inside of ourselves, then we're, you know, almost undoing everything else that we're trying to do to be healthy. And then now, how did that, how have you noticed a shift, if at all, in your interpersonal relationships with other people? Because when the voice inside your head is a toxic one yes. versus what it is now, have you noticed any sort of difference or shift in, in how your interpersonal relationships have been? Can I say something on that real yeah, quick? You, yes. brought, you brought up a good point, yes. uh, a message which is one that I've been pretty passionate about recently, which mm -hmm. is like we can't biohack our way mm -hmm. to healing ourselves, yeah. to regulating our nervous system. Yep. Like there are no amount of cold plunges that can regulate yeah. your nervous system. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly what you're saying. Like we can eat the green salad, yeah. we can work out, but if we're still self-critical in yeah. the way we talk to ourselves day in and day out, yeah. and there's things that... There's emotions that we're unwilling to feel yeah. and suppressing and things that we're experiencing internally. It doesn't, it's, it's a, you're putting a bandaid on mm -hmm. something that's going to eventually just unwind. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a, what you said is so important yeah. that people understand is that you're going to, it's all roads are going to lead back to the inner work yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and until you do that work, until you regulate a nerve, your nervous system, none of that, none of that really matters. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I just needed to preach for a second, guys, because yeah. that, that's been something on my mind. I think it's just this, like, which is great. Like, do the things. Like, mm -hmm. do those things. But I really think, I feel so strongly that they should be supplements for mm -hmm. the foundation that is regulating your nervous system through processing your emotions, through the way you talk to yourself, through giving yourself self-compassion. Yeah. If you just do those things, you're on a great start. All that other stuff is probably going to take care of itself. Yeah. And at that time, I was willing to try or buy anything. Like I would buy any right. organic supplement, try any, you know, workout class that promised the results to, you know, snap me back into feeling myself or the last piece is like all the detoxes and diets out there. So, um, I did whole 30, I've done it five times <laughs> and, uh, it took me five times before I realized, you know, Hey, this is like a mental game that I need to start playing. Um, but I bring that up because on the last time that I did whole 30 was when I had like my worst health scare ever, where I was just out. Like that's when I went on my medical leave because I was just so inca incapacitated and I was eating everything right and I was working out you know an appropriate amount not even overdoing it but my self-talk was so bad at that time that it was turning my nervous system on and when your nervous system is on you can't process nutrients the way that you're meant to so I wasn't absorbing any of the food and I was sick as a dog so exactly what you said like you <clears throat> can do all the things right outside of yourself, but you have to be willing to go inside, otherwise it won't connect. And what are some of those, uh, and you can go, what are some of those, um, thought, what were some of the things that you were saying to yourself and how have those shifted? Like over some of the negative things? Yeah, just like, is it, you know, Jesse, you're so stupid. And like, how has that shifted mm -hmm. and how has that process looked? Like, how have you helped reframe mm -hmm. the way you talk to yourself? Um, I would say like one of my biggest complexes that I had was people don't like me, like they're judging me, they hate me, they don't like me. And so I would sort of walk around with this like chip on my shoulder all day, like going out to prove myself uh -huh. against everyone. And I say it with a smile now because I just don't feel that way anymore. But really what the shift was, was me just accepting myself as I am and also accepting other people as they are. And I think that comes back to your question sure. about um, how did that change my interactions with others? Where I was competing with other people or comparing myself to other people were really just pointing to areas that I admired about other people. And so instead of internalizing that admiration and turning it into a competition, it's then just saying like, wow, you really inspire me. Like, I love the way that you held that call or I love the way that you know, your career path went. You were so brave to take on that journey and just really verbalizing it with people and telling them how you feel and allowing yourself to be inspired. Um, so that really shifted like my health, I think, is just allowing myself to be inspired and even ask questions like, oh, how did you do that? I think my ego was too big for me to say, like, I love the way you did that. How did you do that? How did you learn that? What inspired you? And it, it just opened up the door for me to not know everything and explore new avenues that I haven't thought of yet. Whether it's, you know, a way to handle a sales call or a way to dress or some anything really. But yeah, it really opened, I would say it opened me up and I think competition really closed me off. One of the things I think we should call out constructively, of course, is yeah. the structure of corporate. And, yeah. you know, when you talk about the caffeine consumption, the go, go, mm -hmm. go, yeah. the competitiveness, you're naming a lot of traits and attributes of somebody that a VP of sales mm -hmm. would love to have. Yeah. And so <laughs> talk about the environment now yeah. that you were in that actually celebrated mm -hmm. you as your, and I always picture metaphorically, like it's a dead rose spray painted red, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, talk about the environment that you were in and, and how that can also help or not help hurt mm -hmm. um kind of like the awareness piece of like hey this is not the, the right road yeah i mean any company that puts up a leaderboard for their employees to compete on and has like you know cold calling wednesdays the first person to make a hundred dials you know wins a 200 hundred dollar gift card to starbucks or something like that they know that they're perpetuating this environment of competition and they do it because there's 
a financial gain for the company, for the organization. If more calls equals more deals closed equals more revenue for the company. I mean, it's a very simple equation. <laughs> um, and so some of the work that I'm doing right now with the companies that I consult with for their employee wellness is saying, hey, actually, when your employees are less stressed, and when they're more tuned in to how they're feeling, they can actually perform better. They can actually interact with coworkers better. It creates a better culture and then they stay longer. They're more engaged, they perform higher um, and so on. So yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think a lot of companies are starting to get it um, and wanting to shift their culture because they know that when we feel our best, we do our best work. So you're still selling because yeah. you're still trying to crack into a corporate Yep. infrastructure that has a very old school way of thinking yeah. so what are some of those old school perceptions that you're running into when you're sitting in front of maybe it's the head of HR or the you know heads of companies mm -hmm. to speak to just that that point you mm -hmm. made where is it getting lost on in translation what are some of the perceptions we're dealing with so I would say wellness has become a hot topic and a buzzword and so most companies mm -hmm. will have wellness on their website somewhere. Um, maybe they'll have like a couple wellness days a year that have like a yoga class once a quarter, a smoothie day once a quarter, a team happy hour, um, and all that. And so I don't want to knock those things because I remember as an employee, that was fun. Like I enjoyed that and it was great. Um, and it is, it is exactly what I said it is. It's fun. But if we really want to see an employee who's burnt out make significant improvement in how they're feeling and how they're performing, smoothie day is not going to do it. So um, it really has to be that like culture shift where um, the workload, the management, um, the approach, the expectations, they're all geared towards um, a person having autonomy and choosing how they want to show up to work how much um, they want to take on at one point. If they don't want to do back-to-back -back meetings, they could be allowed to have five minutes in between meetings to take a deep breath and allow themselves to compose themselves and regulate their nervous system and so on. So it's just a minor shift in the workday that creates that big, big change. Um, but to your point, it starts with being open to something beyond a happy hour, smoothie day, or yoga day. And what are some of those ways we can regulate our nervous system in the workplace? Like, what are some quick tips? Okay, this is fascinating stuff. This is from uh, a study done by Microsoft, actually. So what they found is in back-to-back -back meetings, our brain temperature actually increases and it causes swelling in the brain that decreases our performance. It also turns on our nervous system and it doesn't have to be back-to-back -back meetings. It could be anything. It could be the person next to you is stressed and you pick up that energy or it could be you were late running out the door and you grabbed your coffee and you're on the L and it got stopped five times and all that. Anything can turn on your nervous system. It doesn't have to be you're running from a bear in the woods. Do you know what I mean? Um, so anything can turn on your nervous system and it's our job to take two to five minutes when that happens to regulate our nervous system through breath. So what we can do to tell our nervous system that I'm safe and you don't need to be activated right now, you don't need to be in fight or flight mode is deep breathing. Deep breathing actually massages our vagus nerve, which is in the driver's seat of our nervous system and tells us I'm safe. You can relax. You can go back into rest and digest, come out of fight or flight. And so deep breathing can just look like literally closing down your screen, closing your eyes if you can, um, this would be best case scenario, for five minutes and just taking deep breaths where you can actually see your stomach expanding and contracting. Um, if you cannot do that, then do one minute. If you can't do one minute, do 30 seconds. And if you're in a meeting and you feel yourself getting activated, just start taking deep breaths with your eyes open. So there's so many different avenues that you can go down, but really the main key point is deep breathing. And I think such a big part of that is, is awareness, is self-awareness, yeah. like to understand when you are becoming, to understand when your nervous system is being yeah. turned on, when you're actually feeling stressed, because yeah. I think some of us just become so accustomed mm -hmm. to living in a, to living yes. in a stressed out environment without even realizing it. Yep. That's just our home base. 
And like for me, I think a big part of my ability to do things like deep breathing is mm -hmm. to know when I'm feeling stress. Mm -hmm. Like you can't take the deep breaths if you don't know when you're supposed to take the deep yeah. breaths. Yep. So how can we become, if our question is like, how are you able to become more aware of when you are feeling stressed? Like what are some symptoms people can look for yeah. in themselves to notice like, oh shoot, I'm getting really stressed or anxious. Yeah. Because so much, so much of us are like just so unaware of what's happening internally in our oh, bodies. Yeah. Like we think everything happens up here, but so our bodies are telling us so much yeah. and we're just not connected to them. Yep. And that was me. It's like I was in fight or flight, I think for like two, two full years where I didn't come out of it. And that was why I was Big having time, yeah. all the issues was my system was not communicating. It wasn't executing. It wasn't optimizing because I was in fight or flight. So if you are that person that's like, oh gosh, I don't know if I have any stress symptoms, I don't know, but I don't feel quite right, I would just start habit stacking. So I would incorporate the breath at mealtime, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Before you have your meal, just take one minute to do deep breaths. And before a meal is perfect because rest and digest. So we're turning off that fight or flight and then we're able to actually absorb the nutrients in our meal. Um, and then that helps us have the better rest of our day, right? When we're actually absorbing our food. So that would be my one tip is if you, you know, don't know if you have burnout, but you feel a little bit off, just start doing a few deep breaths before every meal. But if you're like, I want, I want to know, like, what does this look like? How do, what do I look for? It's really individualized. So it could be tightness in the chest. It could be a headache. It could be brain fog. It could be like just this like tenseness in the upper body. A lot of people will breathe still from their chest, um, not from their belly or 80% of people actually hold their breath when they're looking at a screen or in a deeply focused state. So holding your breath is a really another big symptom that people, I know I do it all the time, so I always am checking in with myself, that people don't realize that they're engaging in, but they are. Which, by the way, I mean, just drinking coffee that's caffeinated, any caffeine is going to flip that switch on, right? Yep. So that even yep. just the, like, even if your train's on time mm -hmm. and you're sipping your coffee. Yep. Especially um, on an empty yeah. stomach. Yeah. And I, I mean, you're speaking my language and it's, mm -hmm. this is probably one of the most relatable conversations I've had in a long time on, on, a, on a pod level. Well, they're all very relatable, but I'm currently in a commercial role, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's sales on the front lines. And yeah. it's so interesting to just see, again, I go back to the environment and how much is really normalized mm -hmm. to flip that switch on mm -hmm. that we have to deliberately yeah. think about breath, right? And so yeah. like, if you're listening to this and you're working in a corporate environment, don't roll your eyes at it. It's it's really real and it really does require deliberate effort mm -hmm. awareness. It starts with awareness first, but yeah. then it, it requires like a deliberate effort. And I'll say firsthand, you know, I, I talked to a lot of candidates who are mm -hmm. trying to go into sales and start their careers and they ask me about work life balance and I say, Hey, it's night and day. It yeah. used to be terrible for me. I'm only busier now, but I'm you know, it's so much lighter yeah. because of these tools, because mm -hmm. of these things, and that, that's exactly what I coach. Uh, really from the internal and so there's a way that you know you can really equip yourself to navigate the type of environment that unfortunately is so heavily normalized totally the work that you're doing like the sales call the cold call the meetings that doesn't change you change yes. and then you perform better enjoy it more interact better with your colleagues and your clients like when you do this work you change and you become better at the work that you were doing from a stressed out state yeah i think uh, we were having this conversation before this yeah. about like there's almost a sense of like I have to be doing a lot I have to be working a lot mm -hmm. or I feel like I'm not being productive mm -hmm. and because I've because I prioritize self-care so yeah. much I'm actually working less mm -hmm. and getting more done because I'm operating from a place of optimization yeah. of a place of like inspiration and creativity mm -hmm. because my nervous system is regulated mm -hmm. and I think there's a lot of people that will say well I don't, I don't really know and I would just say this because I didn't I was living stressed out for most of my life and not even knowing it I think you almost just have to do the work like do take the deep breaths yeah. just so you can see what it actually feels yes. like to maybe not feel the way you're normally feeling which you yeah. think is normal because it's the only thing you know but there's actually a different route like I look back at myself now I'm like oh my gosh was mm -hmm. I living stressed out mm -hmm. And I didn't even know it. Yeah. And so I think you just got to do it. 
Yeah. You know, like just try it and see how it feels. Um, it's probably the hardest for those people because you're so used to doing the other thing. Yes. Um, I have a thought on that. Actually, maybe two. So when I did, I do stress management um, group session for my corporate clients. And when I did this with a corporate group, they were skeptical. And so we just went ahead and did a breath work all together for five minutes. And then I asked, well, how do you feel now? Like compared to how you felt before? And they're like, well, obviously I feel better. Like, duh. We just closed <laughs> our eyes, sat comfortably and did breathing. I was like, well, if it's so obvious, how, like, why haven't you been doing it? And that was kind of when it clicked. It's like, yeah, wait, this is easy. This is free. This is accessible. I can do this at my desk. The only thing standing in my way was me because I thought I had to do things one specific way. But if I open up my mind to this new way, then I can enjoy this relaxation throughout the day and still get my work done. So just being open and kind of like how I had to be in the beginning of my journey, just being open to what different practices may bring me or teach me about myself. And so how have your values shifted, if at all? Jesse, you know, before, you know, burnt out Jesse relative to yeah. now, like how have those shifted? Like your well, what's important to you, what you prioritize? Mm -hmm. Yeah, gosh, I think with the competitive mindset that I had at least, really it's the ego in action. And so I really wanted to see myself as this like top performer at work, um, even at home, like with my family and um, with friends socially. And that was all coming from that place of that question you asked me earlier that I thought no one liked me. And so I thought I had something to prove to everyone by being this high performing, lovable person. And so part of the work has been improving, you know, my own dialogue, but also realizing I'm a work in progress I am who I am. And if someone doesn't like me, that's completely fine. Like I'm not for everyone actually. And not everyone is for me. And when I act in my truth and in, in my values, then the right people will become attracted to me and people who are not wrong, but are just not like meant to vibe with me will be repelled from me. And that's a blessing either way. Um, and so really my value is just being really curious about who I am and who I'm becoming and what is in store for me on this journey. And the, one of the biggest things that we keep kind of coming up against is like this denial thing, like, oh, breathwork's not going to work for me. Yoga's not going to work for me. Um, you know, changing my diet's not going to work for me. Stopping drinking's not going to work for me. Stopping caffeine's not going to work for me. Those were beliefs that I held on to so, so tightly. And then I became a yoga teacher, became a breathwork teacher, stopped drinking coffee, stopped drinking alcohol, um, and it did work for me. And so everything that's that I probably was, why you value curiosity so much. Yes, yeah, yeah. So that's where the curiosity comes in exactly. Is every time I really like deny something, I'm like, wait, there's something deeper under there that I need to explore. Otherwise, I wouldn't feel so emotional about it. Oh man, it's like the battle is not even giving up the alcohol or giving up the caffeine yeah. or picking up the better sleep schedule or the breath work, yeah. the battle is really just within the ego. Yes. It's really about saying... Your identity. You, yeah. That it's it's really... Attack. I mean, the ego is meant to keep you safe. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, Jesse, like, if you give up all these things, then you're not going to be loved, right? Yeah. Or like, you're not going to... We know this. This, yeah. is, this is safety. And you have to essentially venture out into a dark wilderness of, like, an unknown territory and yeah. really trust a new process. Yeah. And let that then form a new identity for yourself. It's so interesting. Like the battles and, and people will wonder. It's like, oh, I can never get off coffee or I can never quit this. Or yes. I can never start doing this. Those are the really magic saying, words. What they're really yeah. saying is I'm, I'm too scared. to, And, and you love the fear-based stuff, yeah. right? And it's like it's I'm too scared to to go a different direction. Yep. It's supposed I, to be scary. Yeah. Uh, the five C's. Yeah. Inner talk. We've talked a lot about um inner talk we've talked a lot about the way we talk to ourselves why it's yeah. important um what are the five c's that you mention yeah and why should we care about them okay um well real quick i want to just comment okay. i want to comment on what you said yeah. i could never blank is like that is my like sentence i refuse to say it yeah that no that when i say it i'm like oh god like i've got to check this out because i know that mm -hmm. something is there for me and so if you're in the audience and you're thinking 
I could never give up alcohol, give up caffeine, you know, stop doing X, Y, Z, like just explore it for a day, a week, a month, like just see what's there because I, to me, like that is where all the magic is, is the thing that you think you could never do is actually the thing that you're meant to do. Um, so love that you said Ooh, that. Nice little quote there. <laughs> Wow. Um, thanks. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, the five C's. So in like diving into my own inner dialogue, I was able to discover how I was talking to myself was creating physical symptoms in my body. So when we talk about mind body connection, um, you know, I feel like a lot of people think of it as like, my body's over here, my mind's over here, and they're connected by this, this highway, and I can sort of go between the two. For me, when I think about mind-body connection, I really think of it as like water being like H2O and saying like, oh, water is the hydrogen to oxygen connection. Like, you can't just go into a glass of water and say, I'm gonna take out the hydrogen, or I'm gonna take out mm -hmm. the oxygen. They are like bonded together and we can't do that. The same goes with our mind and our body. They are so bonded together that we cannot separate the two. Um, and so when I started working on my internal dialogue, when I started speaking better to myself, my I had ulcers at the time um, that were horribly painful. They were giving me headaches, this whole thing. My ulcers went away. And then I started working on a little bit more. And then my weight gain and weight loss issues started going away and more. And then I started sleeping better. And so all of this work that I was doing on my mind was having physical manifestations in my body. And in working with myself and then working with my coaching clients, I was able to sort of nail down these five internal themes of dialogue that was creating pain for me. Um, and so I'll go through them now. It's competing, comparing, criticizing, craving, and convincing. So I feel like, should I go with each one? Uh, I'm trying to think one that stands out to me. Yeah. Tell me about convincing. Okay. That was the one I was going to pick. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> I love it. It's the one I feel like we don't talk about. Well, I, yeah. I, I want to learn. I want to hear more about to it. Me too, yeah. So convincing is talking yourself in or out of an opportunity. And it can also be talking someone else in or out of an opportunity. And the reason why we really hold on to this one is because we're like, this is how I keep myself safe and likable. So an example might be, I better go for, I better go to this happy hour, even though I feel tired. No, I've or, got a million. I can think of for myself <laughs> right now. Yeah. Or, um, you better apply for that promotion. It's the right thing to do. Even if you maybe wanted to go to a new company or try a new role or whatever. So it's basically, you're trying to play controller on your life or someone else's life rather than just listening to what's there. So you're doing what you think is expected or what would be good rather than what you know in your heart or your intuition to be the best option for you. You say, listen to what's there. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Tell us about that. Okay. The F word. <laughs> <laughs> what's the F word? Feelings. Feelings. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I think about that, but also like that inner dialogue, that like inner guidance system, the yeah. intuition. Absolutely. Yeah. Each one of us has it. The more we listen to it, the more guidance we'll get. So if you're listening to this thinking, well, I don't ever get any inner guidance. It's really, am I ever listening to my inner guidance? And when I do get it, do I follow through? And so when, when, you know, you're at home, let's say watching t TV at night or reading a book and you get this simple message, I should really go to bed now. Do you go to bed or do you keep binge watching show until two in the morning or scrolling TikTok or whatever? And so it's just really listening to that inner guidance and we all have it, that urge of it's time for this or I need to do this or it would make me feel good to do this. Um, and then listening for it and then following through on it. And the more we follow through on it, the more guidance we'll get. The less we follow through on it, the less guidance we'll get. It would be like a friend giving you great advice and you just not listening. Well, we'll, we'll still have to end up following it. Yeah. Like it's still going to tell us where to go because it's going to show us where not to go. And it's going to show us, okay, here's why not. Because you're going to get something poorly is going to happen. And it's yeah. going to keep leading you into the place you're supposed to go. Exactly. And you can continue to resist it but you're going to continue repeating the same patterns and having yeah. the same problems that we've always had. Yeah. 
And it's it's always the paradox, like the, the fun thing is about life is that the thing that we're always that we kind of deep down know we should do is always the harder thing. Yeah. It's always the thing that requires more courage. It's always yeah. the thing that requires a little bit of trust, yeah. you know? And so I think that's why we often, ah, no, no, like it's fine. You know, that's just, you know, no, I'll do that tomorrow or right. whatever. Um, but I love the convincing. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. And like the, the inner guidance, right? Mm-hmm. Like they brought, brought up like an F word, right? It's yeah. feeling. So yeah. ultimately like the voice inside your head is not always just a voice with like speaking to yeah. you in yeah. English <laughs> language, right. but really it's, it, your feelings, is yeah. your emotions, communication yeah. ultimately to your physical, to your body, to yeah. your mind of like, and it doesn't have to be these like, when we say, we say words like courageous, like yeah. doing the, the, the scary thing, mm-hmm. right? It could be so small, like the, mm-hmm. the Netflix versus go, go to sleep yeah. example. It's like you're feeling tired. Yeah. You know, it might be harder to put down the dopamine rush of the Netflix yeah. epi- episode. Yeah. But like listening to how your body feels mm-hmm. and letting that be your inner guidance to yeah. what your next decision should be. Yeah. And in this case, when you feel tired, your body is telling you, you should sleep and yeah. go to sleep. So talk to us about, you know, how you've started to really listen to your feelings, right? Moving away from like the voices yes. and more of like the physical feelings, yeah. how you've been more in tune, connected to it and how you've started to listen to that more. I love this point that you're making. So you're so right. Like, yeah, sometimes I'll get a very astute voice, like do this, do that. Other times it's just a feeling in my body. Like I, you know, when I was getting certified as a yoga teacher, I was really lit up up by this idea of going to Mexico, going on this glamping retreat, unplugging from my phone for 17 days and, and getting certified. And so I had these like full body chills. I felt really excited. I felt this like energy rush happening and it was subtle. I'm describing it now. It sounds like, you know, I was being electrocuted, (laughs) but it was very, very subtle. And so paying attention to what lights you up can be a really good way to know what opportunities to check out. Um, another thing is just, you may hear a yes or a no. Like you may just feel this like, no, kind of like my shoulders closed down. I kind of sink into my chest. I feel this no energy about this thing. It's so important to say no in those circumstances and not push ourselves um, to go do something that we truly don't want to do. Uh, same goes for yes. Um, if I said, I really, you know, walked by the comedy set. What is it? Comedy. Uh, Second City Comedy Second Center. Second City. Yeah. I walked by the Comedy Center and I just felt this like, yes feeling. I felt lit up. I felt excited. I saw the pictures on the wall. I read the brochure. I felt this yes feeling. We've got to follow that. And it's not because we're going to become a famous comedian. It, not necessarily. You might. But it's really just because maybe this will make me feel good. Maybe I'll meet someone new. Maybe I'll learn something new about myself. Maybe I'll build a little bit more confidence. It can be these little tiny gains in the journey of our life and who we are that really just make life magic. Can I? Please. Jesse. <laughs> um, I, I would say you're, you're exemplifying what I would call leadership, right? I think you're, yeah. you're absolutely a leader. And I want to add a layer into your experiences that we are the men in the arena here. Yeah. But I think it's important that when we platform somebody mm-hmm. of your leadership to just take some time to speak to the unique challenges of being a woman, whether mm-hmm. that's in a corporate environment, yeah. but speak to some of the nuance and the unique challenges for the woman that will be listening to this and for the men who out to better understand women, yeah. what you know complexities are maybe unique to that? Yeah. Okay, wait, you said something I'm really excited about. Can I go one direction and then another? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I worked with this company where I was actually one-on-one coaching all men. And I was really skeptical whether they were going to engage with what I was saying, um, if they were going to be able to or want to get in touch with this side of themselves of working on their inner dialogue and um, relaxing their nervous system and all that. And so, you know, I held these one-on-one sessions and I thought, you know, no one's going to show up. They completely sold out. Everyone who signed up showed up. And, you know, the second we got in the room and closed the door and I said, you know, this is a safe space. Tell me what's on your mind. It's completely confidential. Um, You know, it won't be shared with anyone, including anyone at the company. This is just for you. These men opened up in ways that impressed me just so much. And I think I developed so much deeper empathy and understanding for men 
Um, I didn't realize that they were going through so much of the same stuff that a woman is going through in terms of the pressure we put on ourselves um, and just the, the self-dialogue and, and all that. And so I would say the one thing I learned about for men is they have all these feelings but don't necessarily feel like they have a safe space to share those feelings. So um, if you're a man and you're listening, like, I, I guess like my advice or my question to you would be like, who is your safe space? And if you don't have one, like who, who could be one or how can you build one? Um, or where could you find one in your community? Cause it's so important to be able to share this stuff and just get it off your chest because that's half the battle is just knowing that you're not alone. And then for women, again, like I was shocked at how similar the challenges were for our inner dialogue and the nervous system relaxation and how much we push ourselves and all the pressure that we put on ourselves. What I would say is unique for women is in our community, I think we share more openly. Like if I have a tough day, I'm in my group text telling my friends exactly what happened, how I'm feeling. Uh, they're kind of like hyping me up and <laughs> you know supporting me and this, this and that. Um, where I think in in the workplace, it can be a little bit like, oh, she's emotional, mm -hmm. she's irrational, she can't handle the pressure, she's not meant to be a leader, uh, she would be she would be all over the place, she wouldn't be able to lead her team because you know she's feeling all these things, and so that's where regulating I think comes into such like such an important part of our day is we get to take our power back, and this is for everyone. When you regulate your nervous system, you're also regulating your emotions, you're, regula you're regulating how you respond um, in a situation, and, and then that affects your brand and how you show up at work. And so, yeah, I think this work is really important for taking your power back in those gender stereotyped situations of women being emotional, women not being able to handle you know, the pressure of this, that, and the other thing. Yeah, I think we all need to regulate. Sometimes it just happens for different in different yes. ways. Yes. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. we all need to regulate our nervous system. Right. Um, if you could, if you're speaking to the audience, yeah. hey guys, um, <laughs> what would you, to, to anyone that maybe is experiencing burnout, mm -hmm. has experienced it, currently experiencing mm -hmm. it, um, if you could say one thing to them or give them one piece of advice, what would you say to them? It would be that you're not lazy and it's not your fault. Um, so many people will say, I'm so lazy. I'm making so many mistakes at work. I, I don't even want to show up to work anymore. I don't know what's wrong with me. Other people have it so much harder than me. This is a great job, a great company. Why am I so you know selfish or lazy or whatever that I'm not showing up and bringing my A-game every day? And unfortunately, fortunately, Burnout just doesn't work that way. You get to this point where you're been stressed for too long and all of a sudden you're not functioning at full form. It's not because you're lazy, it's because your nervous system has gone through too much and your battery is drained. And so making mistakes is a symptom. Um, brain fog is a symptom. Distance from your work and from things that you used to enjoy is a symptom. So it's not your fault you're experiencing symptoms. And to get back to yourself, all you have to do is regulate your nervous system, breathe, lower your stress, check back in with yourself and return to the person that you know that you are. I love it. I love, it's not your fault. Yeah, I mean, how, fault. How, how good must that feel yeah. if anyone's listening to this? Mm -hmm. um, three questions to wrap up. Okay. Rapid fire questions. Okay. The first one is, oh God, I haven't done these in so long. I don't even remember. No. The, what, if the, your favorite quote or the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Oh gosh. Let me think. My favorite quote. Really blanking here. Um, this is my Instagram bio for a while. <laughs> Trust yeah. the vibes you get. Energy doesn't lie. Yeah, I love <laughs> it. I'm a huge proponent of that yeah. more recently. Yeah, yeah, I love that. You know, if you, if you, if, if something feels off where you're like, I don't, something's off with this person yeah. or this environment, it pro it is. Yeah. You just got to listen and trust yourself because Absolutely. it's the energy speaking. Totally. Um, if you could have dinner with anyone in the world that are alive, who would it be and why? Michael Jordan. I, really? I loved the last dance. I was obsessed with the last dance. 
And he has this whole spirituality to him that I was not aware of before. Um, and really he talked about his inner dialogue and how that fueled him to be such an incredible player. And so I would just love to talk with him more about that. MJ, if you're watching. Yeah. Call you, me. <laughs> something tells me his nervous system was always on. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> yep. Um, and then lastly, like, what does Jesse like to do in her free time? Oh, God. I love yoga, breath work, hanging out with my husband, going on walks is, like, my life. Um, Talk about a way to regulate your nervous system. <laughs> yes. Outside, like just being outside at the park, forget it. Um, hanging out with my girlfriends and just like cooking a great meal and watching a movie and simple gal. Living. Yeah, I'm a simple gal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jesse, well thank you so much for coming on. And then Jesse, where can people find you? Like what where where can we expect to, to see you? Okay, you can follow me on Instagram. My handle is at JPT Health. Um, and I'm also on Substack. I just started a blog, which is substack.com slash JPT Health. Guys, go go follow it because <laughs> I read the first one. I told you before, this yeah. was really well written. It was oh, very thank good. Thank you. Um, we're going to sign off, Jesse. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.